Okay, well, it's after uh, 4 o'clock uh, Central now, so I will hand it over to you, Ruben, if you're ready to get started. Um, I'm here and I'm ready to get started. Okay, so um, thanks everybody for listening in. This is a new thing for me. Can you, John, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, thanks. Okay, great. So this is a new thing for me, giving a talk to an audience that I can't see. Um, we'll hope that I do okay. Um, I'm uh, Ruben Collins. I'm a professor in the physics department here at the Colorado School of Mines. And um, I uh, am going to be giving you a presentation about um, silicon photovoltaics. And what I'm hoping to do is tell you a little bit about the, the background in the field and what's going on, some of the innovations that are near term and a little bit longer term. And maybe if we have time at the end, I'll just talk about a couple of things that are going on that are sort of interesting from the research level. Um, they tell me I'm able to advance the slide, so I'll go down and hit this button, and it did. Okay, so the, the first thing I want to mention is, um, you know, a good question is, is silicon a good choice for a solar cell? And there's a lot of good reasons why you might want to use silicon for a solar cell. One is that there's this history for the microelectronics industry of studies of silicon and background and how to process it and how to make PN junctions. It's a mature technology. Um, silicon solar cells, because there's so much knowledge about silicon, have in general for a long time had pretty high efficiencies. Silicon itself is a plentiful element. If you look over on the right, there's a figure about the composition of the Earth's crust. And you can see that when you look at the elements that are listed here, Silicon is one of the dominant elements after oxygen, so you can imagine there's a lot of SiO2 um, in the Earth's crust. So it's available, that's going to hold on expense, and, and silicon's non-toxic, and that's an a advantage. But the truth is that if I were going to sit down and pick a material to use for a solar cell, probably silicon's the last choice that I would make. And, and the reason for this is that it has intrinsically bad optical properties. Silicon has an indirect band gap. So over here on the right, there's an absorption curve. Um, they tell me that I can click on this little thing, and then maybe I can move this. Ooh, beauty. You can see here this uh, red curve. That's silicon's absorption curve. And what I want you to notice is this is a log axis over here. And what that means is, compared to other semiconductors, silicon's like 10 times less absorbing. And what that means is it has to be 10 times thicker to collect as much light. And what that means is carriers have to move 10 times as far without having something else bad happen to them. So you have to have really high purity, low defect density, perfect surfaces. So the truth is, if you were going to pick something to make solar cells out of, and you were just starting from scratch, and you didn't have this background, you probably wouldn't choose silicon. And yet, history wins. Silicon is the dominant solar cell in the PV market. So this graph shows, as a function of time, the percentage of the annual production of, of PV modules that are um, various technologies. And you can see that the monosilicon and multicrystalline silicon, we'll talk a little bit more about those, are essentially the dominant technology in the market. Um, thin films are kind of the, the green thing up here at the top. There's my little arrow. The green thing up here at the top. And there's actually, I always kind of find it interesting looking at these history view graphs because there's a couple of things to notice here. Right here you can see kind of a growth in the um, thin film. And this is actually largely silicon itself. This was amorphous silicon, nanocrystalline silicon, ribbon silicon. And those are technologies that have kind of gone out of business as a large area solar technology these days. They still exist in niche markets and in thin film transistors and things like that. And if you look over here, there's another dip in the silicon curve. And um, that happened because for a period of time, there was a real shortage of silicon feedstock, of the material you make silicon wafers out of. And that happened about the time that silicon became the that photovoltaics became the largest user of silicon, larger than the microelectronics industry. But the market has since responded, 
and now silicon is sort of coming back as an even larger fraction of the um, PV module um, technology base. If we move on to the, to the next slide, um, this tells us that not only is silicon the dominant technology, China now dominates the silicon PV market. And if you look on this view graph, this is the percentage of total production over here on the left. And um, these bars over here, the different colors represent different um, manufacturers. And so, for instance, down here in 1997, you can see that the U.S. had a fairly significant market share. And if you look over here now at 2015, the U.S. is really a bit player. Um, if you look at China, unfortunately, when you take view graphs from other people, they do things that I tell students you shouldn't do. I tell students never to use two closely related colors next to one another. But um, China is actually this lighter orange color right here. And I've sort of circled some of China's boxes. And you can see that up until about 2005, China didn't have a very large fraction of the market. And all of a sudden, it expanded. And now China owns the silicon PV market. They're the dominant producer. In 2014, of the 10 top module manufacturers, the top five were Chinese. And of the top 10, only two were from the US. It was uh, um, Sun Power and um, uh, First Solar that were uh, the US manufacturers that actually made it on the list. So this is an important thing to take into account when you're thinking about silicon solar cells. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the silicon PV family, about the different technologies. Um, the top bar here is sort of today's technologies. And if you look, um, the reason I'm showing a calculator here is because a lot of calculators have solar cells in them. And the solar cells that they have in them need to be flexible, they need to be cheap, but they don't need to be that high efficiency. And those are actually almost always amorphous or nanocrystalline silicon. Over here on the right, you have the two sort of wafer-based common silicon solar cell technologies, multicrystalline and single crystal. Single crystal is made from a single wafer. Multicrystalline, you can usually tell multicrystalline because it has this sort of funny pattern in it when you look at the solar cell. And um, it has um, crystals that are oriented in different directions. Down here on the bottom, I have some things that if we have time at the end of the talk, we'll talk about their sort of ideas for the future. There's a lot of work being done in silicon nanowire or nanorod solar cells. My research group does things in silicon quantum dot solar cells. And I think the, the area that probably has the most promise for the short term in the future is multi-junction silicon. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so we're going to sort of start at the beginning of this family, which is I want to talk a little bit about amorphous silicon, not too long, because this is a technology that's kind of found by, fallen by the wayside. If you look up here on the right, you can see sort of down here in yellow, that's a crystalline silicon lattice. And you can see that the atoms are arranged orderly, and you can see columns and channels and things. That material, crystalline silicon, has a well-defined optical absorption gap. I have to apologize. Whenever people talk about amorphous silicon, they always put the energy on the horizontal axes and the density of states on the vertical axes. And with almost any other technology, they almost always rotate it and put the energy on the vertical axes. Anyway, we'll have to live with that. Um, you have a well-defined absorption gap or band gap of about 1.1 eV, very sharp edges for the density of states at the band gap. Notice this is a log density of states over here. Now, the material that you see up here at the top is amorphous silicon. It's like the glass in your windows. It's silicon atoms, but they're not arranged in any particular um, well-defined crystallographic pattern. They're random, like a liquid. And uh, if I move to the next slide, now we can compare. Up here at the top is the um, energy structure that we saw for crystalline silicon. And down here is what we get for amorphous silicon. We still sort of have a conduction band and a valence band, but we have these states that extend 
extend down into the band gap. And these states are localized states. They're localized because the, the lack of long range order in this material in the amorphous silicon creates regions that are almost like quantum dots where the wave functions of the carriers get localized. And when carriers end up like electrons in one of these localized states, in order to transport through the crystal, they must hop to another localized state. So mobility in amorphous silicon is actually quite low. In fact, we don't have a band gap, we have a mobility gap. Up here, things move quickly. Down here, things move slowly. Also, because the amorphous silicon has this random crystal structure, you can imagine that once in a while, there's a missing silicon atom. And because of that missing silicon atom, there'll be a bond that is on terminated. Every silicon won't have four silicons attached to it. And that leads to defects, these dangling bond states. And those are recombination centers that can actually hurt the quality of the material. Um, so what we typically do, and I think they're indicated in blue up here, is we put hydrogen into the amorphous silicon. And the idea is that a hydrogen can bond to one of those dangling bonds, remove the state, passivate the material, and so amorphous silicon, you can actually think of as an alloy. It has almost 10% hydrogen located in it. Amorphous silicon technology, even though it has good absorption because you break the selection rule that makes silicon a bad absorber, so you can use thin films of amorphous silicon, it's still true that the single junction efficiency is low. About the best you can do is about 9.5%. Another issue is that when you shine light on amorphous silicon, which is like what you do with solar cells, right? You shine light on them, they degrade. The degradation isn't well understood, but it's pretty much known that the electrons and holes that are created recombine and create more defects. And those defects then become recombination centers for the carriers. So you might build an amorphous silicon solar cell, which has a 12% efficiency, take it out in the sunlight and watch that efficiency over the next day or week drop to 9% before it levels out. And this is a big issue, and it's the reason that amorphous silicon has not been a successful cell technology. Most of the companies that were making amorphous silicon for actual solar panels have gone out of business. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, hydrogenated nanocrystalline silicon is a variant of amorphous silicon. What we do is adjust the growth conditions so that crystals of silicon nucleate. Uh, where did I lose my cursor? There it is. So that crystals of silicon nucleate inside the amorphous network. So we have this amorphous silicon and we have these crystals next to them. Now this can help with mobility because carriers can hop from crystal to crystal. This material is actually a mixture of two materials. It's got mortar, the amorphous silicon, and it's got bricks, the crystalline silicon nanoparticles. The best material has about a 50% volume fraction. This material has much lower degradation than amorphous silicon, but it still actually is not that optically efficient. The kind of solar cells that people make out of these materials look our multi-junction solar cells and you can see a design over here what you have are things like amorphous silicon germanium a low band gap absorber then um, nanocrystalline silicon then amorphous silicon and part of the reason you have to make a multi-junction technology like this is not to absorb light better but because you need to keep a big electric field in the actual um, active region of the devices because if you make the device too thick you don't get the carriers out so you stack a bunch of junctions in a row where each one can have a large electric field in order to collect everything people have actually made triple junction amorphous silicon solar cells with 16 percent efficiency but after they make them they degrade the champion cells were made by the company united solar ovonic and just to give you an idea of the problem with this technology that company went out of business about two years ago. Okay, so now I want to talk about crystalline silicon solar cells and wafers. Um, crystalline silicon is um, the dominant technology, the dominant silicon technology. 
uh, over here on the left, it starts with, you guessed it, with sand, with um, SiO2. And uh, this gets mixed with carbon and heated in a furnace to produce metallurgical grade silicon powder. This is not that pure, but it's a starting material. After you produce metallurgical grade silicon powder, you run it through a process that the traditional process is this one called the Siemens process, which involves reacting it with HCl. Um, for most of you, this has got to sound kind of bad. You, you don't really want to spend a lot of time with vaporous HCl, but this is the process that's used. It makes a chlorosilane, which is then um, distilled, and then the chlorosilane is used as a um, source for chemical vapor growth of silicon. And uh, there are a couple of other options for this right now. They use similar processes, but the, the way in which the growth occurs is different. So a fluidized bed reactor is being used a lot by um, companies in China as a replacement for this. When you get done with this process, what you have is an ingot or boule of polysilicon. And that's exactly the same for multicrystalline wafers and for monocrystalline wafers. And that's where the processes depart. If you're going to make multicrystalline wafers, you take this polysilicon and you melt it in a big sort of a mold. And you cast an ingot. This is a growth, for those of you that are familiar with growth techniques, it's called a Bridgman growth. You control the chemistry as it, or the temperature as it cools to try to get the largest grains you can get. These ingots are cut up and sliced into wafers. And these are our polycrystalline silicon wafers. You can also take this polysilicon and you can use it in a single crystal growth process, like a Shikralsky pole or a float zone process. And there you produce a silicon ingot, which is exactly single crystalline. In both cases, you end up sawing up these wafers. And that's a big issue because you have the work of sawing them up and you have these loss of silicon due to saw curve. And that's something people spend a lot of time worrying about. That's kind of cutting edge technology these days is how can you make these wafers and minimize the loss associated with turning them into wafers. And uh, on the next slide, I just give you um, some information about this. If you look right now at um, the cost of making a um, silicon PV module or a silicon PV solar cell, this much of it, this, um, I've lost my green arrow, the 18% and 16% that are here have to do with the wafering. It's a significant part of the cost, but not as significant as it used to be. And there's a lot of different ways that people are looking at to get around this. Um, I just give a couple of examples here. One of them is to grow a layer of porous silicon, then grow silicon epitaxially on top of it, and then use that porous silicon as a way to separate the silicon off of the substrate and then reuse the substrate. So this company Selexo here and Crystal Solar are both using this kind of a process to try to reuse the silicon wafer and to make very thin silicon wafers that are um, high quality. And um, on the one hand, they're doing pretty well. Um, Crystal Solar has worked with a company in, or with a laboratory in Belgium and they've produced 22.5% silicon solar cells on recovered wafers like this, on um, lifted off wafers like this. Um, the real question is the cost. In other words, you have to reuse this silicon substrate. You have to re-clean it. You have to repolish it. How many times can you use it? Is this really cheaper than making a wafer? I also wanted to mention this approach from 1366 Technologies. Look, I've misspelled technologies. I'll have to fix that later. Um, what they actually do is cast these wafers. Just like I showed you the polycrystalline wafers being cast, they put these in a mold and cast them, which eliminates the need to saw them up. And they have also um, been able to produce pretty high efficiency cells on that kind of material. I, I put this note at the bottom about n-type wafers being important, and I put that there for a reason. I wanted to remind you 
remind myself to tell you that traditionally silicon solar cells have been made on p-type wafers and the reason for that is historical p-type wafers use boron as a dopant the original silicon solar cells were sent into space those wafers turned out to be more radiation hard but it turns out that that um, boron actually when it's heated when it's exposed to light um, these solar the silicon wafers have a lot of oxygen in them and boron forms a complex with oxygen that makes a defect that actually is a recombination center. And so the lifetime or the efficiency as a function of time of a P-type wafer is not as good as an N-type wafer. So there's a lot of work on the highest end silicon solar cells these days that is converting to N-type wafers because the lifetime is longer. Let's see, so um, this is just a, a really sort of stupid tutorial to get you thinking about something. If you're going to make cheaper solar power, you have to ask yourself, how do you figure out the cost of solar power? Well, in a way, it's really pretty simple. You make a system, and with solar cells, the system cost is all up front. You have to build this system and put it out, and except for some maintenance, most of the cost is up front. And what are the system costs? They're the panels that you have to buy. They're this thing called balance of system costs, the inverter that you have to put in, the wiring you have to put in, installation, mounting. You maybe have to take out a loan. Maybe you have to buy some land to put, up, put this, if it's a power company, to put this on. And you have maintenance. These are your costs. Then you have the electricity you're going to produce. There's a certain area to your set of panels and there's a certain efficiency that they have your site is located somewhere if it's in arizona it has high insulation you get a lot of sunlight all the time if it's in new york maybe you get a lot of clouds and so that affects things solar cells change efficiency with temperature you have to understand the temperature of your site how long are your panels going to last these days 20 or 25 years are the lifetimes that are uh, built into the warranties for these panels and so you estimate the system lifetime. Over that lifetime, a 2 kilowatt system may turn into a 1.8 kilowatt system, and you have to take that into account. You can use all of this to figure out the electricity that's going to be produced over the lifetime. Then you divide the cost by the electricity, and you get the dollars per kilowatt hour. Well, if you look at this from sort of a 3,000 foot view, if you want to reduce the cost of solar electricity, you can either reduce the costs, these things up here, you can increase the efficiency, or you can increase the lifetime. Most of the work for the longest time has been aimed at reducing cost. But what's happened is the modules have become a smaller and smaller fraction of the cost of the whole system. All these balance of system things here have not dropped in price as fast as modules. What that means is that today there's starting to be a renewed look at increasing efficiency. Because if you increase the efficiency of the panels by 1%, that gets integrated over the entire cost of the system. You don't need as much land. You don't need as many wires. You don't need as many people to install the system. So while everybody will still focus on cost, that's the main driver, efficiency is becoming something people are paying more attention to. So um, module, this is what I was talking about. Module costs have really dropped. This is sort of a log plot of module costs as a function of the number of modules shipped, the number of modules produced. And this kind of a line is called a learning curve. This region right in here is where we had this shortage of silicon feedstock, but we've caught up now. And you can see module costs are down like, you know, to 50 or 60 cents a watt peak. It's amazing. This drop in the cost of modules has not been accompanied by a big change in solar cell efficiency. If you look down here, these are record cell efficiencies and this one here and this one here, these two blue ones are silicon. 
they've been fairly flat for a fairly long time. If you look at modules, they can do things with the architecture of modules, figure out how to connect them better, stuff like that. Module efficiency has grown, but let's say since 2007, it's grown, but it hasn't grown enough to account for a huge drop in price. The big thing that's happened is this drop in the cost of modules. Now, I put this curve up basically for me. It's to remind me of something. This is a view graph that I showed many times 10 years ago. And it was a view graph that was intended to justify why I wanted to do research over here. This is what we scientists like to do. This is the fun stuff. This is multi-junction solar cells, quantum effects, things like that. Down here you have organic photovoltaics. The idea of this curve is on this axis we plot efficiency. And on this axis we plot cost per unit meter of our technology. So if you have a solar technology that is 30% efficient and it costs $400 per meter squared and you double the efficiency to 60%, but you double the cost to $800 per meter squared, the actual cost per watt peak of that system is exactly the same. So these straight lines represent a fixed module cost of a certain number of dollars per watt the module can produce. And back when I used to show this view graph, silicon was over here, wafer silicon, at 350 a watt peak. And of course, then the argument that I made when government people were around and we were talking about getting funding and stuff, and it's a valid argument, was these technologies were able to operate on these lower cost lines. Well, this red thing shows what's happened to silicon since 2007. There's been a modest increase in efficiency, and actually here I'm showing cell efficiency and I should be talking module efficiency. But what's really happened is the cost has dropped, and silicon is now right down here in the mix with these things. In fact, right now the, the cost, it's an argument, because nobody knows whether China is giving us the real price of their cells or whether they're um, selling them under cost because they have too much production. But the reality is we're very close to 50 cents a watt peak with silicon solar cells, which is a number I never thought I would ever see. Okay, so this is um, the point that I was making before. Um, module costs have really dropped. Uh, let's see if we can figure this out here. Um, the PV module is this dark blue, and the balance of systems are this light blue. And you can see that in recent years, the module costs have dropped, so they're a much smaller fraction of the cost of the system. And this right here is sort of um, large commercial. If you look at residential, the cost of the module is a real insignificant fraction of the total cost, because balance of systems costs are much larger. So what that's telling us is there's room here to think about new architectures for solar cell, for transferring high efficiency monocrystalline designs to multicrystalline, to reducing the gap between research record cells and manufactured products. If you can just increase the efficiency of a, of a module by 1%, you can drive the cost of the whole system, the whole cost of electricity down by 1%. And that's a big deal. So um, I want to talk a little bit about technologies, because even though we think of silicon as a mature technology, there's a lot of really clever innovation that's going on in this field. So the first thing we've got to understand is what the losses are in a solar cell. So up here on the top, I've kind of drawn the sort of solar cells I would have students in my lab make. We basically diffuse a um, N-type layer in a P-type substrate, put on a back contact, put on these front contacts, and, and this kind of a solar cell has a lot of optical losses. The first one is reflection. Silicon has a very large index of refraction, and a lot of the light would be reflected from a cell like this. The second thing is transmission. 
um, I told you that silicon's not a very good absorber. And if you're out here at these really long wavelengths, light can actually go all the way through the cell and not be absorbed. So what do we do about that? The design you see down here is actually the most common solar cell design of the day. It's an aluminum back surface field cell. It begins with a regular wafer, but you can see that we texture the wafer. We put these jagged features on it. And the idea behind these jagged features is that when light comes in, it hits them and it scatters. And because it scatters, it, it has multiple opportunities to be absorbed by the material and it doesn't reflect back. And so it becomes kind of an anti-reflection coating. In fact, lots of times they deposit an additional anti-reflection coating on the wafer. So when you look at the cell here, what you have is these features that scatter the light around, an anti-reflection coating, and at the back you have the same thing, a texturing that scatters the light back into the cell, and so the cells have a higher efficiency than this design we would consider up here from light management. And there's a lot of work going on in light management. So for example, here's a cell that is textured. It's textured by using an anisotropic etch. Um, people spend a lot of time talking about black silicon, additional texture to reduce reflectivity even further. So here's a textured surface. But if you look at it really closely, what they've done in this particular case is grown zinc oxide nanowires on the textured surface. And that gives us an additional amount of scattering. So if we look here, here's the reflectivity from bare silicon. Here's a reflectivity from bare silicon with pyramids on it like this. And here's a reflectivity from bare silicon with pyramids with this texturing on it. And there's actually quite a bit of work going on in this area. And as you can imagine, the real issue is, how do you do it cheaply? And how do you do it so it's robust, so it doesn't get destroyed out in the environment? OK, so we've talked about losses associated with light. Now let's talk about losses associated with carriers. This view graph shows you the fundamental loss associated with carriers. Every solar absorber has a band gap, an absorption threshold. If you send through photons that have a lower energy than that band gap, they pass right through the cell. They don't get absorbed. If you send through photons that have a higher energy than that band gap, they get absorbed, but they get excess energy relative to the band edges, and they relax to the band edges. And that energy is lost as heat. So these are two things that you can't get around. So you can imagine if you make the band gap bigger, you'll lose less to heat, but more to transmission. If you make the band gap smaller, you'll lose more to heat, but less to transmission. So if you plot efficiency as a function of band gap, it has a maximum in it. And that maximum is the balance between these two trade-offs here. It also manifests itself as a balance between the current you get and the voltage you get. So um, there's a lot of curves plotted down here, but silicon's in a good spot. It's near the peak in this measurement. Um, there are a lot of tricks that people are trying to use to either absorb below band gap photons or absorb the energy of above band gap photons of that sort of advanced research. So this is a loss you can't avoid. You can avoid it, but you can't avoid it in a conventional cell. These are losses you can avoid, and they're particularly problematic in silicon. When you create an electron hole pair, the electron hole pair can recombine non-radiatively or without being collected by your contacts. It can combine on a, recombine on a defect in the material. It can recombine at a defect at the surface. It can give its energy to another electron through an Auger process. So modern solar cells are designed to try to eliminate these problems. And over here, I'm showing two examples. This one's called a PERC cell. It's a passivated emitter rear cell. And this one's called a pearl cell. It's a passivated emitter rear locally diffused cell. And these are highly tweaked cells designed to eliminate these kinds of losses. First, they have a, a really use, they have our texturing, 
but they also have a passivation layer up here on the surface and an anti-reflection layer, which is intended to eliminate this surface recombination. This one has an oxide on the back and just a small hole for the contact, which is intended to limit recombination at the back surface. This one does even a step better by diffusing a junction in here at the back. It has this same passivation here, but it has this locally diffused junction, which eliminates recombination at the contact even more. This pearl cell for, I think, um, since 2000, held the record efficiency for silicon. It's a design made by the University of New South Wales. They actually make most of the solar cell, advanced solar cell designs that have been made. And um, it is the technology that SunPower uses in its high efficiency panels. I just want to mention some other things that are going on. Um, this is an old idea, but it's back with a vengeance. This is called a bifacial cell. You can see it has all of the passivation and, and things of the other cell, but it's designed so that light can be collected from the front and can be collected from the back. And the advantage of that is that you can collect ambient light that's reflected off of the ground and improve your efficiency. This one is called an interdigitated back contact cell. These contacts up on top represent shading, and that reduces the amount of sunlight that makes it into the cell. Here, you actually have a PN junction at the back of the cell. It's like a lateral PN junction that connects across here. So you eliminate the shading on the top of the cell. And this is the most recent record efficiency cell. This is a heterojunction solar cell. Um, it's developed by Sanyo, but now owned by Panasonic. And uh, the acronym here is heterojunction intrinsic fin. So you know that it's a, got a translation unusuality associated with it. And this material actually does not diffuse in a PN junction. It brings back our old friend amorphous silicon and deposits amorphous silicon as a passivation layer and as a contact layer, P-type amorphous silicon and N-type amorphous silicon. This one uses an interdigitated back contact. These hold the record efficiency of 25.6%. The thing I will tell you about them is they're a little tweaky so far. It's hard to make them as, reproducible, as reproducibly as a pearl cell. And so um, there's a lot of work being done to see if this can be improved and if this can be the technology of the future, moving up module efficiencies. OK, let's see. So I'm just about done here. I just want to talk about some of the cool things that are going on in um, sort of the next generations of silicon solar cells. Um, silicon multi-junction solar cells is a, is a big topic that's getting a lot of interest right now. The idea of a multi-junction solar cell is illustrated in this figure right here. You have a high band gap cell and a low band gap cell. And in that picture I had here where these carriers go through that are lower than the, that have a lower energy than the band gap of the cell, they go through this first cell, but they get absorbed by the second cell. So you pick up that current that you would have lost here, and these two cells are in tandem, so you get a large voltage. Actually, the current has to be matched between the cells, the way these are drawn, but you get an enhancement in voltage because of the voltage across this cell and the voltage across this cell. So the blue photons get absorbed here, the red photons go through and get absorbed here. The um, diagram over here at the right is actually a, a sort of an analysis of how to get the most efficiency out of this kind of cell. And here what we have is the bottom of the cell, the bottom band gap. And so that's going to be our silicon cell. So here's 1.1 EV. And you can see that if we want the maximum efficiency, we need the top cell to have a band gap of about 1.7 EV. So there's a lot of work going on trying to do this. And this is an example of some colleagues at NREL who have put a alumina, uh, indium gallium phosphide solar cell on top of a silicon solar cell. This one is not grown on top of it. It's actually lifted off of a wafer and then epoxied onto the top of it. 
and they can get fairly uh, high efficiencies this way. They can move the silicon efficiency up quite a bit. I think, though, the one everybody's really interested in right now is a perovskite solar cell. The idea of these new perovskites is they have almost exactly this ideal band gap, and they seem to be tolerant of um, not being too lattice matched to their substrate. So there's a lot of work going on. Um, I'm the editor of Applied Physics Letters, and one of our top publications with the most citations for the last um, two years is a perovskite solar cell on top of a silicon solar cell. Let's see. So um, moving along, I just kind of wanted to show the silicon nanowire solar cells. The concept here is rather interesting. The idea is light comes in this way, but if you can make it so the PN junction is radially around the edge of the wire, the carriers get collected laterally. So you can actually fix it so that you get really good absorption, this long absorption length here, but the carriers don't have to move so far. And that sort of gets rid of one of those problems that silicon had. Um, these wires are grown in a bottoms up fashion, lots of times using a vapor liquid solid catalyst like this, where you put the catalyst in and then the wire grows up. Or they're etched in a top down fashion, the way you see here. Um, there's a group at Caltech that's doing quite a bit of work on these for water splitting, actually, to break water up into hydrogen and oxygen. I don't want to say a lot about this, but I do want to say that one of the issues here is that you're trying to make a better solar cell in silicon by making a lot of surface area. And that means you really have to pay attention to passivation. And these solar cells so far have shown very high currents, but they've had difficulty getting good voltages. And that is an indication of problems with um, recombination at surfaces and interfaces. Um, finally, I just want to show an area that my group works in. Um, we're looking at using quantum dots in solar cells. This is very far out work. The concept is that you can actually change the band gap of quantum dots by changing their size. So you could make multi-junction solar cell, for example, where you start with a silicon substrate, then put quantum confined dots, then maybe more quantum confined dots. This graph here actually shows photoluminescence emissions, so it's like band gap of silicon quantum dots, which have been etched in a solution etch. And you can see the band gap changing as the size changes. The real issue here, and it's the fundamental one, is you need enough coupling between these dots to get transport but not so much that you lose quantum confinement. And, and that's a challenge. The approach that my group is working on is to go back to that nanocrystal and silicon concept that I showed you at the beginning. And actually, we, we grow silicon quantum dots separately, and we inject them into a region of a reactor where amorphous silicon is growing, and we can build up structures that are amorphous that are silicon quantum dots surrounded by amorphous silicon so we get the passivation by changing sides we can make them tunable and uh, i just put this view graph up this is some work done by one of our students where they show that the degradation of amorphous silicon is much worse than the degradation of these materials that we co-deposit and control the size and surface termination of the quantum dots so um, I'm going to uh, mention that um, we have a lot of funding sources, a lot of them from the DOE and the NSF. And uh, there's been a lot of people who've contributed to the work that I've talked about here, in particular, a bunch of graduate students. I know some are listening in today. And uh, I want to thank you all for your time. And um, I'm going to quit here. <laughs>